the midst of learning about graphs that show changes over time. And we've sort of set ourselves on talking about showing changes in levels of our data. So we have dollars or units or percentages. But maybe we don't always want to show the levels or the values, and we just want to show how the rank changes over time. Well, that's where the bump chart comes in. The bump chart is just like a line chart, but it's used to show changes in rank over time. And to help us understand what the bump chart is and how to read it and how it can be used, we have Rob Simmon from Planet. So Rob, over to you to explain the bump chart. Hi, John. I'm looking forward to the release of your book. Thanks for inviting me to participate. Today, I'm going to talk about the humble bump chart, which is a type of graph that shows rank versus a second variable, usually time. And it's, it's pretty easy to build a bump chart. All you need to do is an, imagine a ranked list, say of race drivers, ordered by, by their position as they cross the finish line after each lap. And then update the list every lap and connect each driver's name. And you'll just end up with a stack of lines which represent relative position over time. For example, here's a bump chart showing position of each driver for the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix, which occurred a couple weeks ago in Imola, Italy. And the drivers are distinguished by their team, the color and their team. Um, so the two Mercedes are teal, uh, and they started in first and second, uh, followed by Joss Verstappen in the Red Bull, he's blue, and then the yellow Renaults, red Ferraris, etc. And as far as the race goes, for the lead, it was pretty boring. The two Mercedes ended up one and started and finished one and two, although Hamilton and Bottas did switch position mid-race. Joss Verstappen in the Red Bull managed to work his way into second, only to crash out, which actually played a role in the events towards the end of the race. The midfield, however, was much more interesting. You can see a tiny bit of reshuffling as a few cars managed to squeeze by in the first corner. And then the drop in places during the first pit stop when cars pitted to get fresh tires. Most of these managed to work their way back up through the, through the positions over the next 30 or 40 laps. You can see a couple of people who, who managed to hang on to their tires for the first half or so of the race and then pit and see them fall in position. And then you can see the events that occurred in the aftermath of Verstappen's spin, which brought out a safety car. This also highlights one of the weaknesses of the bump chart, and that is that it only shows position, it doesn't show magnitude. And so you can't see the cars actually bunching up behind the safety car when they had been spread out over the entire length of the circuit beforehand. But you can see some of the, the action that happened in the wake of the safety car. For one, you can see George Russell, his line ends when he spun out, trying to keep his tires warm, stuck behind the safety car, going pretty slow. Uh, and it was sort of a tragedy for him since it was his first opportunity to, or his best opportunity to score points in his first two seasons. You can also see Sergio Perez in the pink racing point stop for tires, and then get stuck behind slower traffic and end up losing positions towards the end of the race. At the same time, Daniel Kvyat, even though he was on older tires, managed to overtake several cars in front to finish fourth. So this is a fairly good summary of what you can glean from a bump chart and leads to a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. Bump charts only show rank, not quantity. You can tell who's in the lead, but not by how much. And unfortunately, techniques to show magnitude tend to make, chart, make bump charts so messy that they can become illegible. Also, rankings really need to be tabulated over regular inter intervals. So it's more appropriate for something like a race, where position is calculated at the end of every lap, than for a full NHL season, where teams play three to five times a week, but the number of games played at any given time will vary quite a bit for each team. Also, bump charts get complicated quickly, so watch out for large numbers of categories. It's much easier to interpret a bump chart for, say, the 28 Democratic candidates that started the 2020 primaries than for the 176 riders in this year's Tour de France. And this is compounded if there are large swings in rankings from data point to data point. It's difficult to trace these irregular, often crisscrossing lines, but interact interactivity can help a lot here. Also, think carefully about initial ordering. 
How can you aid a viewer in interpreting your chart? For example, compare these two vintage bump charts that show the size of U.S. states uh, from census data collected in 1880 and 1890. In the 1880 census, time increases from left to right, which is usually good and follows graphic convention, but it started with the date that each state ratified the Constitution. So tiny Delaware, which is regularly at the bottom of the chart, appears first and then quickly drops to the bottom. In the 1890 census, however, the authors redo the chart with the most recent date first. This puts the most populous state, New York, at the top, which makes it easier to trace the evolution of the state's population over time and gives a more familiar frame of reference for contemporary readers. Another interesting tidbit that you can see in both of these charts is the fate of Virginia, which starts as the largest state and remains one of the most powerful and influential through the middle of the 19th century. But between the 1860 and the 1870 census, it loses several positions. At the same time, a new state, West Virginia, pops up near the center of the chart. And that's because Virginia was split in two during the course of the Civil War, creating two smaller states. And Virginia never reclaimed the same powerful position it had at the beginning of our country's history. So that's a brief summary of what you can do with a bump chart. There's certainly a lot of good ones floating out there on the internet to check out. And I hope you find them valuable and can use them when you need to show rank over time. And thanks to Rob for that explanation of what bump charts are, how they work, and how to read them. I hope you'll be able to use them in your own work. So until next time, this has been the One Chart at a Time video series. Thanks for watching.